Okay, welcome to the SNARS, the Sierra Nevada Amateur Radio Society monthly um, meeting. This is Barry K6ST, and today is Saturday, May the 7th, 2021. We have a very special guest from St. Louis, um, and that is Bob Heil, K9EID. Many of you know him through Heil Sound, but there's a whole lot of cool things he's going to share about some history of Heil Sound and some very amazing, um, amazing things in ham radio and things that uh, we don't know about. So, Bob, you're, on, you're uh, spotlighted, you're being recorded, and thank you so much for coming to the Sierra Nevada Amateur Radio Society for an hour. Welcome. Okay, everybody. Let me make sure this is up okay. Very good. Well, thanks for the invite. I really appreciate being here, and we've got lots of things to go through today. And uh, I hope everybody is in good shape and healthy and you know, all of that good stuff. So uh, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes to tell you about where I came from. That's so important uh, to let you know how I learned about all of this stuff. Um, and I'm still learning every day, I have to tell you. <clears throat> I actually started my life at the age of 10 years old uh, playing an accordion. And then two years later, my parents bought me a Hammond organ. That was a big deal. And um, I took to it immediately and a couple of years later I became the organist at the Fox Theater in St. Louis I was a substitute for Stan Can, who he was the regular organist there and I have to say it was uh, really a great part of my life and and the reason was that that organ hadn't been played in 20 years and we had to tune and voice about 3500 pipes and why I tell you about all of this is it was a big part of my life in that I learned how to listen. A lot of people just hear. Listening is a mental process. And I learned how to do that and all of the voicing, the nuances and the distortions and all of that of all those pipes. Well, about the same year, I got a ham radio license, K9EID. I was a technician for 17 years. You're going to say, why? Well, that was the beginning of the largest sunspot cycle. And uh, six and two meters were open like 20 meters, 24-7 just about. It was an amazing time to get into ham radio. But I didn't know that <laughs> right off. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was just living... Uh, all of the things that were happening. Well, a few years later, I got a call from the Fox Theater again, and they said, hey, we're tossing out some of our speaker systems. It's been here since 1932. Well, a ham doesn't throw anything away. And so I figured, yeah, why not? So <clears throat> we rented a big truck, and away we went. Well, speakers on the on the right, those are 16-foot folded horns. There were four of them. That's just the left side of what uh, we put together. The other two I got from another theater. Those are Alltech A4s. And I'm just playing. I mean, it was fun to play with all this stuff. Had a bunch of Crown and Macintosh amplifiers. I figured they were pretty good, and of course they were. And uh, we repackaged the pr Crown uh, because that was a hi-fi amp to sit on the shelf, so that didn't work. So we call it the high Omega. We were licensed by Crown to do that. <clears throat> well, uh, my life really quickly changed when that Keel Auditorium had called me one day because they heard I had this big PA that I was experimenting with. My first real experience <laughs> was the Jimi Hendrix experience. I didn't hardly know who Jimi Hendrix was. And away we went. It, it, it really uh, charged me up to, wow, this could be something interesting. So we started building PAs, big ones, building our own amplifiers. Those amps you see to the left corner up there, those are 400 watt omegas that we built in our plant. And of course, the crown you saw. What's interesting about our amplifiers, <clears throat> they were modular. Never been done before, but I figured, man, if you're out and one of your amps go down, what do you do? So we build it modular so you could, in about 10 minutes, you could take it out of the case, get your little tool kit that came with it, and away we went. 
big time. And we were doing multi kilowatt. We're talking six and eight thousand watt systems for big arenas. We were doing the major groups around the globe, and um, just just having a big time. And along about that time, I met up with Joe Walsh and the James Gang. Well, a couple of years later, he had a solo group called Barnstorm. And he wanted to do a song in there. He had played around with a little box and a speaker, but he wanted something more powerful. And so we built the Heil Talk Box. Little did I know, it was, it's probably one of the most <laughs> known things about Heil Sound. And uh, Joe had a, a hit record, uh, Rocky Mountain Way. And a year later, uh, the little gal you see down on the left, Penny McCall, she was living in my hometown of Marissa, Illinois, because a lot of the roadies and tour managers, they moved to Marissa because they could get all their gear together. We had a rehearsal hall and really cool stuff. But uh, she was living there with one of the tour managers. I had, I'd lost track of her. She called one day and says, hey, I'm with Peter Frampton and I need, I, I need a Christmas present. Don't send him a guitar. He's got a lot of them. So you know what I did? I sent her one of the Heil talk boxes. And from all of that, of course, we uh, we we really did. Of course, that's all the ham radio in me being able to do all that stuff. And, of course, that became very popular, still is, all kinds of bands used. I even hear it in commercials. Well, my life changed pretty quickly along about 1971. Paul Klipsch called me. I answered the phone. I, uh, Hello? And he said, this is you, Heil? And I said, it is. Who's this? This is, this is Klips here. He's a real crusty old guy. I'm going, this is God on the other side of this phone. Good grief. He wanted to come and see this multi-kilowatt sound system he'd heard about. So he flew his uh, little Bonanza airplane up to Marissa, Illinois. That's about 50 miles south of St. Louis in southern Illinois in the coal fields. And it was an amazing time. Uh, he, was a, he, was, he was a big, tall guy. And all day long, he's, well, why do you do that? Well, how come you do this? And so on, so on. I go, whoa, this is amazing. Paul Klipsch is here. <laughs> and so uh, after showing him all I did and, and telling, because he was really on to, how did you learn all of this stuff? I said, well, ham radio. No, like, we're, what college? I didn't go to college. I barely made it out of high school. Uh, ba barely. I mean, my grades are terrible. Why? I had been playing, I had a career for three years, probably making more money than the teachers. I knew what I wanted to do. So I just, just barely got out of high school. And it was all about ham radio and that crazy pipe organ. And so he was very amazed. So he put me in his plane, flew me back down to his home in Harp, Hope, Arkansas, and it was a few days of absolute unbelievable times for me. He was the father of the hi-fi movement in the 50s. And he was the guy that invented the folded horn for home use. Uh, you see him standing in front of a plexiglass. Uh, one. He, he did one in plexiglass so he could see all the different angles. It, it started out as a 15-inch speaker. But it then exponentially all worked itself out until it went into the corner of your room. And the speaker looks like this. When you fit it into the corner, they bolt it right into the corner. The eight, you got to have an eight foot solid wall this way and an eight foot this way. Your room became the last of the 16 foot horn. If you've never experienced a K-horn, notice I did not say here. If you've never experienced a K-horn, do so. It's an amazing thing. That building you see was his lab. That was an old telephone exchange building. And just an amazing few days with him. But he, uh, he wanted to uh, guide me to something. He said, you need to do the studies of the Bell Labs. 
He said, if you're playing with audio, there's a couple of things that you really need to, to get into. I didn't know, and I quickly learned, that the early telephone system did not work. They were mushy. They had no clear speech articulation. What are they going to do? How, how's it going to work? And so they put 4,000 scientists at Bell Labs on this project. I mean, this was a big deal for the world. They had to make this telephone system work. They had two wires that hooked up in New Jersey all the way across America, and every 500 miles was a relay station to build up and make sure that everything was linear. As it went in, it went out. Well, it didn't quite happen that way. And so they had to bring in two of their lead scientists to really dig into it. I do hope that everyone knows about Dr. Harvey Fletcher and Dr. Weldon Munson. They came up with the Fletcher-Munson curve. And it is a vital thing to know about the Fletcher-Munson curve if you're doing anything in audio. You'll notice, uh, first of all, it looks like a ride at Disneyland. This is what your ear is doing. And you're going to say, well, you're like, yes, you do. Every human. I put the top at 110 dB. Yeah, we're, we're kind of almost flat. But as you get down into here to where you're listening today and so on, you're looking at 20, 30 dB. It looks like a ride at Disneyland. Those two guys figured it out. Our ears are the problem. And they came up with this revolutionary thing about 2.5K. That's a 3K wide bandwidth you're looking at there. Notice at 2.5K, check it out. Wow. That's because that's where all of the articulation is. I'm going to take out of my mixer. I have a parametric equalizer in this mixer. And I'm going to take out just 2.5K. Listen when I do that. As I rotate that down and get it there flat, uh, what happened to my articulation? What happened to my audio? Oh my gosh. What, what, what's going on here? I'm not turning the bass up. I'm not doing anything. I'm turning down 2.5K. And so here we go. I'm going to bring it back up. And as I bring it up, you will understand the S and the F and the P and the B are very, very easy to understand. I'll turn it back off. That F and S, the essence of sound is gone. Bring it back in. 2.5. That's the major piece of audio that we all need to know about. And especially when check that out that that thing is it's 3k wide isn't that like something you talk into every day <laughs> of course it is and so we have to look at that and understand hmm 2.5 huh you're going to hear a lot about that later on but now that they discovered the problem what are they going to do to figure it out there were no equalizers equalization did not happen and so what are they going to do? Well, they had to do it with passive filters, with a high-pass filter. And that the simple version of is it a capacitor and a resistor. Certain size capacitor, you pass all the audio through there. It'll All of it goes through, depending on the size of that cap now. There's a formula down there to do all this. But then as all of that comes through that you want, you want to take some lows out you take a resistor to ground. That's a high-pass filter. Uh, the, I, I put up the low-pass just because I did. <laughs> and that's the reverse of it. <clears throat> it all goes in. And the, high, uh, the highs go to ground with that capacitor. But, of course, that's the reverse of what the uh, telephone system needed. They, they fixed it with high-pass filters. And so the lovely 
telephone system was finally on the road. Well, in 1929 to 30, right in through there, there was a guy by the name of John Volkman. He was working for RCA. And in the late 20s, actually it was 29, talkies came into the motion picture world. Up until then, it was all uh, orchestras, or in the last, that last 10 years, it was all this, a theater organ. That's what I've been doing for years. It's how I learned to listen. That one's about 10 feet in front of me. And, and so the theater organ, it had Steinway pianos, it had marimbas and xylophones, all kinds of instruments. They were all operated from air solenoids. They were real instruments with little hammers over each one. They had the pipes were real trumpets, real clarinets, and so on. That's how the theater organ works. Very different from a church organ. Well, what are you going to do here? Uh, we got sound systems, and they don't work very well. So young John Volkman took to the challenge. And he used simple RC filters because he knew the telephone company used it. Why not me? <clears throat> so what he did is he did one of these little guys so that he could, he had various uh, assemblies of high-pass filters. And he could go in and put this in series with the audio amp and a program source and figure it out. He And then he would go to all kinds of theaters that were RCA equipment and fix them. It was a big deal in there. But here's something a lot of people don't know. From 1920 to 1967 it was void of serious equalization. Oh uh, yeah, the hi-fi world in the 19, all oh, along 50, 48 to 51, 52 came in. That was all done with uh, they had bass and treble controls, but all they were were just variable resistors, and that was it. It it was okay. I had one of the first hi-fi systems. I was 18 years old, and I loved it all. It happened to be an RCA system. It was really great, but um, there was no equalization. Well, I had heard I just barely gotten into the sound reinforcement business. I had heard that Langevin, a studio uh, equipment company, had come up with an equalizer. Whoa! I jumped a TWA airplane out of St. Louis, go to California, and bingo, there it was. I could see it, hold it, and buy it. They had the first equalizer. You see at the top of the little controls where you select the frequency and then you notch or boost it. It was a it was a crude thing, but it worked. And I said I told them why I was there. They had heard about me in my <laughs> six and eight thousand watt PAs. I said, Well I wanna I wanna do this because uh, I'm all we're using right now is uh, different cabinets different speakers to, to create more treble or more bass or whatever. The mixers were ridiculous. This is what we had. All of us, the sound, sound reinforcement business, that green one, yeah, these all came from mixers for like broadcast and, and stuff like that. And that green one, there you go. You got six channels, period. Uh, no equalization, had to do that with the speakers and things. And that's what I mixed Jimi Hendrix and Joe Walsh and all those early guys with. Wow, I, here I was in a place that looked like they could help me. And I said, well, I, I want to get uh, some of these. He said, well, now wait a minute. We got a couple of new products that you probably haven't heard of yet. It's uh, right around the corner. So he took me in another room, and that's what I saw. Now to you guys and gals, you're going, oh, big deal. No, you got to understand, there was nothing like this. I just about lost it. I'm going, whoa, a graphic equalizer? Are you kidding me? Notice how I have it set. <clears throat> 
notch out some of that problem in the six and eight hundred not very much bass but i got the 2.5 crank pretty good of course i did <laughs> they took me in another room and they were building mixers i said oh man because you see with the rotary mixer i just showed you you it's hard to mix because you can't see where the knobs are exactly this was something so i will um, I got involved and I bought a pair of those. I bought the graphic equalizer. Come back to Marissa. I had a cabinet builder there that built this really cool console for me. Two mixers. So we had 16 channels of slide controls. And that's a compressor limiter above. That was really neat. But at graphics over there where you see that little bright spot where the flash <laughs> went off. So Heil Sound was really making it happen. We were doing really good stuff and having a lot of fun. But I had not been on the air f for 12 years. Completely closed up shop. And I thought maybe I should get back into it. And uh, I got an extra class license because there I... I just I had my technician for 17 years and had a lot of fun my goodness I mean, WAS and I don't know how many countries and stuff it was really great uh, I was one of the first of uh, the 10 people that was on single sideband in 19, uh, 1958 and uh, that's a whole nother story but I get back into there and I was appalled why? Because I'm hearing stuff like this. CQ, 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 CQ field day, CQ field day, CQ field day, CQ field day. What is all of that about? Distorted, bassy, no articulation. But zero, Oscar Juliet Yankee. Hey, a few guys had it right, but this is like, are you guys kidding me? So I knew that I had to do something about this. That was not going to be good. So I borrowed a little chapter out of John Volkman. You, you know who I'm talking about there. The young boy that equalized all of the uh, RCA theaters. And I thought, hmm, if we could have some kind of equalization, because... I didn't I, I I didn't know of anything but I'd been out of the out of the business of ham radio for a long time but I went ahead and I built the first equalizer the EQ200 and of course I was on the air on 40 meters just about every night and people were really clamoring what do you do and how did you do that and instead of that mushy stuff you heard hmm with their matching microphones. The only matching is they're painted the same color. They fooled you guys for years. They don't build their own mics, and that's another story for another day and later on. <laughs> so I wrote an article. I sent it to QST, and they called me. And they said, this is a revelation. This has never been done. We're checking through everything. Nobody's ever done an equalizer for ham radio. <clears throat> this will be our lead article. It will get the cover award. <clears throat> and I, I wrote it as a DIY. You know, it, that's what I was hoping what everybody would do, a DIY article and build it yourself. But it backfired. <laughs> I, well, my mistake was... I, I put my phone number in there. People started calling me. I had by then gotten totally out of the sound reinforcement business. I sold the systems, uh, and a big part of it went to Holland, Michigan, a company up there that continued on with some of it. Pete Townsend bought about half of it to take back to England so he could help young bands and so on. But anyway... The plant was closed, 7,000 square feet, and I kept, I hadn't gotten rid of all the printed circuit uh, and the wire tempering, all that kind of stuff. Well, hmm, people started asking, I thought, oh, hmm. So I called back 
my best two solder gals and away we went and we were building eq 200s that was the first step of Heil sound in the ham radio business everything else had been in the pro audio and sound reinforcement so uh, in 1982 we opened uh, just a small piece because i didn't know what was coming but I pretty much knew where we were going. But there were a few problems, as I discovered as I'm listening around. And that was how to adjust the audio. Uh, and it was pretty simple, but yet some didn't know. So we had to really start working. Uh, and I started working on a real early website type deal, and uh, we could show people what to do. And then adjusting your radio, you, you have to you have to understand what you're going to do before you ever sit down at a transmitter. What am I going to do? Am I going to just talk to my buddies? Am I going to go serious DXing? Or am I going to be a net control? You have to first, the very first thing you do, I know you turn it on, <laughs> you set the transmitter bandwidth. This is vitally important, and this is why. This is K9EID, and we're transmitting at 2.9K. 2. 2. With... This is 2.4K, and as you note, it's nice and it's articulate, but the whole bottom end drops out because of the filter network. We'll go back to uh, 2.9. Now, this is the, uh, the 2.9, and it's much smoother has much more fidelity. So we have to we have to understand what we're going to do. And again, if you're going to do rag chew, you set that transmitter bandwidth for 100 to 2900. If you desire less bass, 300 on the low end. And ICOM and Kenwood and all of these, all this is all available to you. Well, in 1999, I got a letter from Dr. Inouye, ICOM's founder, and he had a picture of his station. It was one of those great IC781s. Remember that? That was a great transceiver. DXers loved it. It was the first that ever had a scope. It was an actual CRT, by the way. And he said, I'm thinking of new radio line. And in that picture of his station, you had one, he had one of my gold lines. And he had an EQ200 that he had put together. And so he wanted to make sure that I uh, didn't have any changes or whatever. And so the history is there from the Pro 1, Pro 2, Pro 3, all the way through all of the ICOM line, up until hey, the Bob, new we lost one. your we lost your video. It's all black right now. Really? Huh. Yeah. Okay. There, now you're back. Well, so all the way through the pro lines, up through the 7300 well, okay. and the 7610, yeah. and all those others. Thank you. You're back. Yeah. Okay. What happens in there? Hmm. Difficulties, huh? The switcher died. Anyway, all the way through that has my EQ 200 and I was really thrilled by all of that and, and it it really did open up a lot of things uh, even up until this little guy the new little 705 if you guys and gals don't have one of these get it <laughs> it's an incredible toy it's a 7300 in a little three pound box well, he's five watts. It's got all of the all of the menus, everything that a seventy three hundred has. Plus, it's got two meters in D star, and my equalizer. It's a wonderful little box, and they sent it to me, uh, as they did many rigs. That's why I got so many around here, because it has a very special input and a very crazy little plug. So. We're just starting to produce 
the adapter for the 705. And, uh, but we work with ICOM hand in hand. And we also do some things for Yesu, as we'll see in a minute. Well, we, I, I didn't exactly know where all this was going to go uh, because there, there, were, there weren't anything out there. There was no information. So I had to really start writing a lot of things about all of the information, that, how to set up your radio and so on. But it's very simple. Let's look at a couple of things here. There's a 7300. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to go down there and set that transmitter bandwidth, TBW, at 100 to 2900. Go up to the base, roll it off, minus 2 or so. Treble, see that, that base is sitting at 160 hertz. Where's the treble? You know where it is. <laughs> That's a 2.5. You can't change that, but you sure can increase it. And that's what you're going to do. You'll uh, <clears throat> increase the treble, roll off the bass. If you're going to do DX work, you do the reverse of that. First of all, <clears throat> you're going to set up the transmitter bandwidth at 500 to 2500. I don't care what's what bass. I don't want bass. I want all of the top end I can get. And so you set that. You take all minus two or even less and all the treble you can get and that's what you do for the dx work <clears throat> that control you'd probably do the mid 300 to 27 but you experiment listen to yourself listen listen it's a mental process Listen to yourself in a pair of headphones. I always use another receiver. You can use their monitor. Monitors are getting pretty good, I have to say, in the late model radios. Uh, Dr. Inouye also asked me to build them a proper microphone because he knew. And uh, this is what came of it. And it is the microphone for all ICOMs, the ICM. Uh, almost spells ICOM. Won't work on a Kenwood, won't work on anything but ICOM. Comes complete with the cable, so you can't plug a different cable into it. And plug it in, and away you go. Gorgeous, gorgeous audio. What about Yesu? Well, <clears throat> a couple of years later at Dayton, Dr. Hasegawa came to me, and he... He's a big tall guy, and he comes. He goes in my booth. He comes in. He said, uh, "Hey, want to talk to you about the EQ stuff?" Oh, oh, well, let's step out of the booth here, and we start talking. And I said, "Well, we we can do it better. Ah, I want to do it better. We can do it with a parametric. Ah, oh, that'd be good." I said, "Well, not so fast. Why?" I said, mm "Hmm, because of education. What mean? Well." With the two-band EQ that we did for ICOM, I set the frequencies and they're fine. But with a parametric equalizer, oh my gracious. You're going to have three filters in a parametric. You could have more, but we only need three. And each one has three controls. You know what that means? You have nine controls and you don't know where any of them are. None of them are preset like the ICOM. It's a totally different deal. So, here we are, trying to figure it out. Well, we're going to do it. Okay. So, I started working with them to develop the parametric for all their ASUS. There's a parametric equalizer. That happens to be a 528E, which is a, it's an equalizer and a processor that's used in just about every radio station and has been for decades. That one is over in my console for my AM transmitters. Up at the top, it has a mic gain. It has processing of compression, limiting, de-essing. So if you have a, a host that has more emphasis on their high E's and S's, it gets rid of all that. But look at the bottom picture. That's what we're interested in, those three filters. You can set the frequency. I set that one at about 100 hertz. And I set the octave at two, two octaves of bandwidth. We'll get into that in a minute. That's the bandwidth of that filter. 
And then you either cut it or boost it. Well, of course, I cut it a little bit. And then 2.5K, you better believe it. And 2.5 is it, magic, as we know. And we're going to set the octave at a couple of octaves and boost it to about plus 12. And then for, for the AM, we're going to use 6K and so on. That's how you do that. So... We got together and yes, we did do that to the Yesus, and it really is gorgeous. There's only one problem. Shortly after the, uh, the first rig, which was a FT 9000, my favorite radio, nothing like a 9000. Why? Because I got my way. First of all, it has a three pin XLR broadcast balanced input. I, I, I try, I try all I can to get these manufacturers to listen. They'll listen to something, but they won't listen to that. Well, that's crazy. Balanced audio really can solve a lot of RFI problems with your audio. And that's what it should be. Well, that does. You look at a 9000, it's got an XLR and a three pin. Baby, yeah. Okay. And I took off the ALC meter. What do you mean you took it off? We don't need it. Yeah. Well, well I didn't really take it off. We relabeled the ALC meter. See, a lot of people don't understand what's ALC. That's how he set mic gain. And so if you have a 9,000, it says mic gain. It does not say ALC. Thank you very much. So now we really have some things in that transceiver. We've got parametric equalization. We've got balance line in and a mic gain. Okay. So this is what we're looking at. This is one of the ASUS set up. They're all the same from the 9000 all the way through to the 101. Yes, they all have different assignment numbers. For this, I took all the assignment numbers and I fuzzed them out. We don't care. You got nine of them. What the, the, they're telling you, 201, 202, 203. Another one would have 301, 302. Another one would have 501. Forget it. Just go in, turn the equalizer on, and go to work. The first filter we're going to do is frequency of 200. We're going to notch that through 4 dB, two octaves of bandwidth. What are you going to do with the second one? See, this is the problem. Guys don't know where to set that. Well, I usually set mine somewhere between six and 900 cycles. Why? There is something about that range it's real boxy if you do this with your ears you'll as you talk you'll hear that real boxy sound we want to get rid of that boxy sound so anywhere from 600 to 900 minus three and where's the last one 2.5 k plus eight wow wow here's the simple version you go to the, my website under the support page we have all things ICOM, all things Elecraft, all things Yesu. There's about 50 pages in there. Don't be afraid. Dive into them. And uh, that's this is just what I just told you. Now, interesting, they have two parametrics in all the Yesus. The second one, if you're in the DX mode, you can do all of that over again. I know, I make... People are like, what's the matter with you? Don't worry about it. If you have the right microphone, you know how to talk into it. We're going to get into that. And you have things set up the way we just said with that 2.5 rise. You don't need to do a whole bunch of other things, especially compression. Compression is a, it's a nuisance to me. It distorts... You heard it a while ago. It does not sound good. Well, Bill said I'm louder. No, you're not. You're only louder. Go back to the uh, 
Fletcher Munson curve at the at that perceived loudness. Your only loudness that you want to think about is 2.5K. If you have that set right, bingo, you don't need compression. And I get a lot of guys disagree with me. I've never had anyone yet, and this is an open invitation of anybody to prove to me that it really makes you sound better. When I use the right microphone, I have it all set right, my bandwidth set right, that's what's important. So those are all things to think about. The, uh, the parametric is really great. See, you can move things around. And you, uh, the bandwidth, you see, you can widen it out. The bandwidth is really nice there in this graphic. I usually set mine to around two. Uh, you can get up to ten if you want, but that that's all great. But then you got to you got to think about Kenwood. They came to me when they were going to do their first equalizer. I, I fixed out a system for them. We do a six-band graphic. Uh, they rejected that. They went with, are you ready for this 13 band? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and that's why a lot of them are still in the default mode. They can't figure all this out. It's terrible. That's their book. Look what they did. Raised up all the bass and rolled off all that top treble. Are you kidding me? This is what it should be. And even may, maybe a little more extreme in the 2.5 region. But you certainly don't need 13 bands. If you have an Elecraft or some, any of the others, this is kind of how that all sets up. You roll off the bat, and when I'm talking about roll off, you don't just go from one extreme, you kind of feather them out as we go from 50 up to around 200, 400, and then we feather it back up to 2.5. And that, that's how you adjust equalization. It's, it's very, very simple. But again, uh, it's all about listening. All about listening. And then we get into a situation of the receiver. This is very important. Nobody ever talks much about this. Take a listen to this. Roll off the RF gain. Yes. I never have my RF gain wide open. Never, ever. And neither should you. Well, then you can hear the wikis. Oh, yes, you can. Pay attention. Now, listen. When we lower the RF gain, the signal does not go away. And here you go. The other thing to pay attention to here is the AGC. If you don't do that slow, it's just all pumping and carrying on. Let's take a listen. About new right now, and it's really old technology that just kind of got forgotten. And uh, somebody like Bob or anybody else got really rid of all that pumping. Yeah. Here goes the RF game. This old uh, stuff that we used to do. Wow, it sounds like I FM. It to a new, uh, that single side band, it works great, you know, so properly adjusted. That's very good. Here comes the I RF gain the back. Uh, ability and the to fast. Come along with this uh, hobby. The, um, I think you have to agree. Mm hmm. There again, I don't read things about this. I'm also a nut. I think everybody needs a scope. And I am an absolute nut for having scopes. Well, you can buy them at a ham fest for 50 bucks, 30 bucks sometimes. But uh, I don't see any coax connector. So how, how I use that, Heil? Oh, that's simple. You go to Antique Electric Supply. You need to go there anyway. What an incredible company. They have every part in the world, especially older parts. Buy a little box. Put two connectors in there. And... We're just going to pass the RF through this box. I used a piece of RG8 uh, in, uh, inside the, you know, the center conductor. But in the input, you build a voltage divider. 51K to 680 to ground. And at the junction of that voltage divider, you put an 0 0.04 over to the RCA jack. Bingo. You have a scope. 
And you can see if it's flat topping and distorting and all kinds of crap coming in. The next thing that we have to think about is how to use a microphone. What are you talking about, Heil? I know how to you do you? Because I hear a lot of people on the air that don't. There's a lot of things that I learned from Paul Klipsch. But one of the things he gave me was this. The Audio Cyclopedia. It's 1,750 pages. <laughs> you want to know something about audio? There it is. This has been with me all these years, and I still refer to it. And it's amazing what I learned. One of the things is this. Every time you double the distance from your microphone, you lose six decibel. Now think about it. Doubling your power only gets you what? Three. You're going to throw six away. Watch and listen as I back off. I'm not touching anything. But the audio just goes away. Oh, well, Heil, that's no problem. You just go over here and you just crank up that audio. Oh, and then I sound like I'm in a roller rink. And I hear you guys, some of you guys. And, and it's like, don't do that. You lost your transient response. You lost your dynamic range. What's that all about? The transient response is very important. It's how fast the diaphragm can come back up after it's pushed, after you say something and it goes down. How fast is it going to react in between syllables? You lost all of that. The other thing is about a thing called plosives. What are you talking about? Oh, this drives me absolutely nuts. Yeah, copy that. Copy that. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, I've, I haven't been right on here. as much as I'd hope. That's for sure. But I have been on sometimes early mornings, and uh, not the last couple of hours. Drive the diaphragm. Just you know, actually hurt to sit here at the desk and and uh, move. And it goes down into the voice coil, and it really pops especially with P's and D, and some people have much more air than others. You want to use the proper filter. They come with all of our microphones. Now, here's the deal. You don't do one from Walmart for a dollar. Get on the internet, I buy 10 of them for $4. They're not acoustically transparent. So that's why you'll hear some guys, hey, Bill, take that stupid muff off. You sound muffled. If this changes it, it's not the right thing. It's not acoustically transparent. Notice when I put it back on, you did not hear any change in the audio, except if there are any blasts, they're gone. And so these are all such important things. At least I feel they are. But that distance of the microphone, oh, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that really that really is something special but we're you know we've over the years have built some very special microphones and again i learned it from the uh, scientist and my audio encyclopedia microphones have power focus you never hear about this because sure an electric voice not, they, they don't have it i don't know what their problem is and actually it was joe walsh that asked me to do this one time he said, build me a microphone and I don't hear anything from the rear, but it's all in the front and I, I don't have to move around. You see, other microphones, you got to stay right here. I don't care what you're doing. And, you know, you've seen these things. They all use them. Well, they all use them for habit. <laughs> no, no. Watch what happens. Watch and listen. What happens if I move away? It's gone. I, that's why you always see these right here. And the bands have to be there. Joe said, I don't want to do that. So. Watch this one. We built this with power focus. You can move 180 degrees and it's still there. I just listen to the science. 
thanks to Paul Klipsch, I mean, he turned me on to this science, and wow, it, it, it means so much, but I don't know why these companies aren't listening. It's pretty terrible. And he also wanted me to build him a microphone that would really get rid of the rear and go down into 20, 30 cycles. Well, what I did is I came up what we call the PR40. This little guy, and little did I know what was going to happen. I'm just building things for Joe just to goof around. Hmm, this was not a goof, let me tell you. The PR40 is the most amazing microphone. It's a dynamic. I do not like condensers. I don't think we need them. They're a scourge to the earth. Heil, are you crazy? No, I'm not. Because a condenser, and oh, I hear guys trying to use them on ham radio, and I just go freako. I finally have to tune off. I can't listen to it. They pick up the whole room. That's what they're made for. They're made for recording studios, to record symphonies. And you're going to stick them on a ham radio. You're going to pick up all this crap. Well, oh, the bells out are sound good. No, you don't. Listen to the nuances. And so, I got to watch it. This thing gets crazy because <laughs> it's got a lot of output. But it, uh, it's an amazing sounding microphone. The top end is so good, and it gets down to 28 cycles. No other dynamic will do that. None. And so, again, we have our power focus. But watch the screen. This is very important. It's the only microphone that will get rid of the rear because it has 40 dB of rear rejection. Watch. But it's, it's 40 dB down. How in the world did I do that? Well, if we had another hour, we'd get into my favorite subject of phasing. Two signals out of phase cancel. Well, why can't I do that to get rid of the rear? Why hasn't Electrovoice? Why hasn't Sure? Why hasn't Neumann? All these multi-million dollar companies done it. And then they come to me. Honest to God, when I first brought this out, wanted to know how I did it. And my answer to them was ham radio, and they'd look at me like, what's wrong with this guy? No, it was. I'm an antenna freak. We could have another hour about antennas and phased arrays and how easy it is, but how wonderful. Watch this screen. Listen to this when I talk in the back again. How did I do that? Well, I did that very simply. Here's what I did. First of all, I wanted a large diaphragm. They all tried it, but they all failed. They all have three quarters or an inch. This thing's an inch and three eighths. And I put it up on top of what I call a collection tube. And I opened the whole bottom. You see, every other microphone in the world, they have four little holes, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, little eighth-inch holes. That's the only entrance to the rear that would be out of phase. No, it's not enough. So this is what I did. We get 360 degrees underneath the element. Bingo. And so that's how the PR-40 has really gained some real foothold, not only in the sound production, but studios and the what really took hold were the broadcasters. Sirius Radio just bought 250 of them and tossed all their RE-20s. I know that RE-20 guys go, oh my God, you know, really? Uh-huh. And so we're very fortunate. And again, it was ham radio that allowed me to know how to do all this stuff. And there's just so much going on. And f for the past 30, about 35 years, uh, we've been the choice of the de-expeditions and all that uh, contest ops. And 
we're very fortunate. But there again, we're doing things for them that nobody else has ever done. Plug this mic in here. We're the only company that for the past about 12, 13 years have done things right. I have phase reversal. Told you I was a nut for phasing. Huh. What are you talking about? Phase reversal on a headset. Yeah. You see a little weaky. He's, you know, you're in a pileup. Yeah, there's a little weaky back here. You reverse the phase on the headset and he moves up front. You, you can move signals around in your head acoustically by reversing the phase. We also have an, again, I'm listening to you guys and gals. We have another jack for your monitor. So the logger can plug. You don't need a bunch of Y cords. And a lot of people have asked me for years, do a balance control. I have hard of hearing on one side or the other. Again, all this stuff, interchangeable elements. We have a DX element, a broadcast element, and one for the ICOM. So I'm, I'm very happy with this. This thing is incredible. The speakers are great. And I learned that from Paul Klipsch. And it, it, it's an amazing headset. And that is why you will, you will see. You go look at pictures of any uh, operations and contesting and so on. They mostly have our headsets. And that's why. And I'm, I'm very happy to help them and blessed to be able to know how to do some of that. But uh, I... Uh, I get into all kinds of other things. How much time do we have, Barry? Can you tell me? Yeah, so we're kind of coming to the top of the hour, um, okay. uh, probably maybe another few minutes and maybe okay. a few Q&A, uh, Bob. Yeah, uh, that's what I figured. You know, let me come back sometime. We'll talk about phased arrays and all kinds of cool antenna things. I just There's so much of it. And, how balance line works so much better for your microphones and stuff like that. But I do want to do one last thing. I, uh, for my, for many years, I've hated receivers. Working for the companies, being inside these companies, I try to help them. Why don't you do something with a receiver? Oh, receiver, fine. No, it's not. We got a little extra speaker. Yeah, right. It's, it's a, it's a stupid little three or four inch speaker in a box and it's not right. And it's 300 bucks or whatever. I said, nope, we're going to solve that. We're going to solve that real easy. So I borrowed some things from Paul Klipsch. Of course I did. <laughs> Look how big the magnet is on its speaker. The magnet's really big. The speaker's fantastic. And it took me a long time to find the right company to build a speaker that I wanted. And so we built a speaker, unlike any other speaker for ham radio. Got a balanced line input. Oh yeah. There's a five, uh, the five, the little five inch speaker and a three and a half inch tweeter. And they're all in tune boxes. That's what we learned from Paul. But here's the big deal. I built this equalizer, and this equalizer is a parametric. Of course it is. <laughs> the center control is parametric. And let's take a look at all of this and see where we are. First of all, we have two headphone amplifiers, one for the logger, one for the operator. Hmm, okay. And we have three different equalizers. This is just a regular shelving at, at uh, the high sit at 6K. The low sit at 160. But here's the kicker. This is a parametric. And we can choose 
First of all, this is the, the drive, the, the gain of that, so we're just going to set the gain. We can go from 400 to 4,000. And I'm going to play you some things that I recorded off air. And take a listen to how good all of this sounds. Let me get this little level up for you. There we go. But, uh, I was basically starting at the bottom, so uh, that's the way you hear this who, guy. Who spend, spend 20 years in the, in the Navy or whatever the military is. There's the way he is flat. Retire. People say, well, you got it made. No, you don't. Here comes the guy that's all I had a gun lost on the other night. I, it's a D-104. Drives I, me nuts. Thought, well, I wonder if I can copy that. I need to put some lows in it. I had about 30 words a minute, so okay, I got it. I speeded up the tape and... Sure enough, I can copy flat, the way I you had a gun lost on the other night. I, I want to add some things. I there. thought, well, I wonder if I can copy that. It had about 30 words a minute. Here comes so the biggie. I speeded up the tape and... Sure enough, I can copy it. I'm going to set this flat the way you hear it. Echo India 8 Bravo, Lima Bravo. There it is flat. Four Sierra Sierra Germany. Hope I have it right. Sierra Sierra Germany. Name is Lim Lima India Alpha Mike over. The way you hear this. Echo India is Bravo Lima Bravo. E I A T L B calling him right. There's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't have this. What's really crazy about it, you can use your left side or your right side headphone if you have a hearing imbalance. This is a record out. You plug that into your computer and that's how I make these recordings. And these are all just wonderful things that you, you, you just don't hear about. The, the, the companies, I don't think they care they stick a speaker in it. <laughs> That's not the answer. I'm sorry. But again, we're dealing with manufacturers and a lot of them, they're not hams. I don't, I, th I think that's part of the reason. But the parametric receive audio system has really been something special. And I'm really proud of it because it's helped so many. I get so many letters, emails, and phone calls telling me I gave them their radio back or their television. A lot of it, me being one of them, using it on my television. A lot of them on computers. There's nothing like this. And so I'm really excited about it to bring it to you. A lot of this stuff is in my handbook. If you don't have one of these, you might want to check it out. Most of the dealers have it, or you can order it from our web, uh, our website. We're very fortunate that and blessed that we're the only manufacturer in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's a mixer I built for Quadrifinia for the Who to do four channel audio in an arena. Uh, the second picture down there, that's ZZ Top's mixer and uh, the, the first talk box and all that kind of stuff and monitors. We're the first company to figure out how to build monitors without feedback, how they do it called phasing <laughs> yes and last but not least i was just awarded a honorary phd from mizzou university so all of this stuff is all because of ham radio i couldn't do any of these and that's why i'm here i want to share some of this with you and there's so much to talk about but we got through a couple of it so barry it's all yours have we got any questions yeah, wow, a fascinating conversation, and thank you for bringing it back to it's all about ham radio and when you were young and a lot of tinkering. So let's do, uh, let's see, uh, John Miller, you want to take yourself off uh, mute on your end at the, um, at the uh, training center, and then we'll get people on Zoom to see if there's any questions. Hang on a sec, we've got two locations here, um, Bob. Okay, well, while, while, while he's doing that, do we have any questions on the Zoom side? Just go ahead and unmute yourself. And, um, oh, wait a second, i gotta, I got to flip a button. <laughs> Sorry, I got it. Okay, go ahead. Do we have any questions on your end? They might have to come up to the front or ask you the question in order to get it out to us. Bob? 
I don't mean Bob. I mean uh, John. Anybody? Sorry, Anybody? Speak up loudly. Are you going to be at the National Association of Broadcasters Convention Wednesday night this year? We will not be there this year. No, we've kind of scaled things back because of all this COVID nonsense. And uh, we haven't sponsored that for the past five years. So I started it years ago. For We were there for, I don't know, six or eight years. But uh, we're not going to be there, unfortunately. We are going to Dayton, but we're not going to take our 100-foot booth that we usually have. Uh, we're going to spend time with our dealers, so you won't find a Heil booth, but you'll find us there uh, with all the different dealers that we work with. And then I'm doing a workshop at 1050 on Saturday morning, but we will be at Dayton. Will you be going to Pacificon uh, in October, Bob, or not? Do you know? That's still up in the air. I'm not sure yet, but I... We're working on it. Let's put it that way. Okay. On the West Coast. Any other things? Any other questions from the training center uh, with all you out there? Hey, Bob. I got an ICM. Uh, great mic. Is it, can you hear me, Bob? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Just want to make sure. You know, I'm getting the thumbs up thing, and I'm going, well, I can't speak any louder with our, my voice. Anyway, uh, I got the ICM, and it's a great mic. Uh, I mean, it changed. It changed. I had an ATM 12, and uh, I wasn't. I wasn't satisfied with it. You know, it just didn't it didn't do what it was. I got the ICOM 7300, you know, and I tweaked the audio with that. With that, then uh, I mean, with that, and it just wasn't wasn't coming up right. And then I got the ICM. I read about it. And it says it's, it's pretty much it helps out the uh, the uh, uh, the ICOM 7300 and the other ones. Well. I put that thing on there, and it, it just it just came alive, you know. But what you did to it, though, man, it just came alive. It gave me. Well, thank you. Well, the the ICOM, all of them have very low gain preamplifiers. From day one, back in the '60s when they came on the scene, they didn't even have a preamp in the radio. It was in the microphone. How stupid was that? And a couple of years later, they they moved, uh, put a preamp, but it was not very good. It was real low gain. I finally convinced them that they needed to help. They still didn't get it up all the way, but at least it's better. And, but that's why 7600 especially, got one right over there, got a 7610 here. They all have lower gain preamplifiers. That is why Dr. Inouye asked me to build the proper microphone, and I did. And I appreciate your comments on it. I've never had a bad comment with that microphone into an ICOM. It's really superior. So good luck and have fun. You betcha. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Everybody's happy, Bob. Okay. The story. Okay. The story. I have your headset, and it really uh, improved my CW copy ability massively. I don't know what you did, but I could pick things out of noise so much better with that headset. Well, that's what I said. I work. I work very closely with some of the great DXers of the world and contest ops, and uh, we just build it to what they need. They tell me what they need. Manufacturers don't really care. I know. I try to get them to listen. No. Nope. But, uh, yes, uh, there's nothing like our headset. There's all kinds of headset companies, but I'm sorry. We, uh, they don't listen to you. <laughs> I do, and we make it happen. <laughs> Thanks for the report. <laughs> okay. Hey, hey Bob. Uh, <laughs> I have a, uh, a Elite Pro 2 headset book with Boom, and yes. uh, there's I, well, I've got a problem. I don't know how it happened. Whatever. I'm, I when I when I start talking, ground comes out. You know, the ground noise comes out. Um, disconnect. I thought it was, well, it was one of the adapters. I had a couple of them for backup, and neither one caused a problem. But uh, so I thought maybe the the microphone or something got bent or cut or, or pinched or something. Uh, what is it doing? I didn't understand. What is it doing? Uh, the people 
people are telling me uh, they hear a hum when I'm talking. What radio? Uh, ICOM 7300. Hmm. Do you you don't have the IC element in it, do you? Yes, it does. It does. I think it does. That's crazy. The IC it says IC. I got an IC adapter on. Adapter. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, send me an email. Just my call at A W R L. See if we can get you fixed up. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate sure. you. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey Bob. I'm more say one thing. If I can say one thing, we've had a lot of people talk about your excellent service that your company has provided over the years. I know that means a lot to many people. Where you don't uh, you don't fight with people, you just get the product fixed. Oh, no, I treat you like I want to be treated. <laughs> okay, and and Donna is something. She's been with me 26 years. She's not a ham, but uh, she'll you can ask her any pin out for any radio. She's amazing. But we build it. She she's built stuff. She then can service it. She knows how it went together, so on. That's all very important to me. And I appreciate those comments, and I get them a lot about the, about her service department. Very good. Anybody else got a question here? Okay, it looks like the trading shit is good. Uh, Barry, got okay. Anything? Okay, thanks. Let's uh, see if anybody on the Zoom side uh, has a question. If you do, just come off uh, mute and give your call sign, and we'll acknowledge you for Bob. Anybody on the Zoom side? Yeah, Bob, I have a question for you. Yes. So um, this is an audio question, um, but it's not transmit, it's receive, and it's CW. And then we'll go to Craig Sandy. Um, so here's what happens, and it doesn't matter so much what the radio is, although some radios are better. Um, so when I start cranking the filtering, like for instance, I have a 7300, but it doesn't matter the radio, and I start cranking the filtering in, more on CW than on phone because it's more narrow, right? So it goes, you know, wide and then narrow and narrow and narrow. And so it goes, you hear the, all the shushing background, I go, like, shee, shee, shoo, shoo. And when it narrows up, if the signal is decently loud, like uh, auto peak filtering, I, I can hear it decently. But if it's above the noise, but kind of not quite there, it, it, I don't know if it's my hearing or my DSP in my brain. I, I, I have a hard time because of all that. The filtering, you know, takes all that background noise and shushes it. Is that an audio level setting? Is that a brain hearing setting? What, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, there again, if you had... If you had a, a, a parametric equalizer, you could go in and notch yeah. as you yeah. go over through and see if maybe see there's what, something what in there. That, yeah, you know, got it. Perfect, yeah. thanks. We also we also have Craig Sandy. Hey, Craig, you want to open your mic up? Let's see if I let me see if I set the right thing on here, Bob, and then we'll get you out of here. No problem. Um, Craig Sandy, let's get to Craig. Okay, go ahead, Craig. Mute. Open your mic. There we go. Okay, I was able to unmute before. Um, hi, Good. Bob. Uh, Craig Sandy, AE7I. I met you at a club meeting in St. Louis back in the uh, early 80s when I was going to medical school. So uh, it was, it's great to see you once again. Um, just a quick question. I've, I've got an older Flex 5000, and it's got equalizer settings for receive and transmit. Mm -hmm. And you can go into you know, a huge number of uh, modifications or just a free channel. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's your thoughts about the Flex 5000 and the quality of the filtering when you do it with that? Oh, it's great. Absolutely great. And no, no question about it. My, uh, okay. you know, my... My only, th my only thing about it, I wish they'd use XLR's standard mic connectors. <laughs> they got you know the, a lot of their, a lot of them are using a mic connector like this. I hate that, but if that's what they want to do, and I know why they're doing it to save space, but no, it's really great. Uh, all of them have 
Good stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, now that I've uh, listened to you, I know how to properly set it up. So I'll, yeah. I'll be experimenting with that. Thanks so much. Appreciate well, it. And everybody, if you have a question, don't be shy. Send me an email. We'll get on. We'll get on Zoom or Skype. I do. I spend my whole day. That's what I do. A lot. Of, I don't know where this rumor came out that I retired. Nonsense. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah has retired, and her son is now the president. But uh, no, I'm I'm still very much there. And what I do, I, I, this is my lab. This is where I do it all. And I built this studio just to be able to do all. You, you can't see all of it. But there's still more behind there. But uh, anytime you send me an email, and um, if I can't answer it on the email, let's get on. Ver we have video today. Isn't this great? My gosh. So don't be shy. No question is dumb the first time. So let's make it happen. Great. Any final questions for Bob before uh, he takes off? Hey, Bob, I have one final question, and that is when you're not uh, in your engineering uh, place and you're not mm -hmm. playing the organ, and you're not doing pro audio, tell us about just for a minute or two about what you enjoy in actually being on the air, what kinds of things do you do and if you get on the air and talk, or CW mm -hmm. or, or data, <laughs> or none. Oh, yes. I'm on the air every day, every day, but I'm on – AM. Uh, this whole console over here. In fact, I got my Harvey Wells out on the bench there. <laughs> that whole console is, is all AM stuff. A lot of it I've had since, well, the Harvey Wells I've had since 1956 and it's still working. But I love AM. And uh, there's just so much about it that I guess brings back the old times and stuff like that. But I uh, I spend my time on AM. A lot of great things happening uh, on AM because now one of the better transceivers on AM is a flex. It's gorgeous. But now all of them, the 7300, even the little 05, all of the rigs today, the all of the Kenwoods, they all sound great on AM. But uh, you just have to remember uh, a little bit about what's going on. Uh, uh, there's an AM window. A lot of people are not aware of this, and it um, really kind of disturbs me. This was set up back in the 50s when Sideband first hit, somewhere around 58 or so. I was there. I mean, I I was on 6 meter AM, but this was down in the low frequencies. They had wars. I know one that happened. A guy from Paducah went down into Tennessee, and when the guy in Tennessee, who was a, a, one of the new sidebanders, opened his door, this guy had a shotgun in his hand. I want to talk to you about being in our on our frequencies or whatever they were gentlemen they sat down with 10 other guys and set up an am window it's a gentleman's agreement 3870 to 3890 7290 7295 and so on and sideband you have you have a vfo and you have a, a you know a whole ton of places that you can go but uh, on am <laughs> Uh, we are um, crystal controlled, these little guys right here. So we can't move. <laughs> and so you just have to respect that. It's a gentleman's agreement. Problem is, a lot of hams that got into the business along in about late 80s and 90s, that they forgot about it. They didn't get carried on. But no problem. But that's what I do. And, um, of course, the other thing I do is this. This is where I spend a lot of my time. And that's usually how I... Indies, Barry, give me about two more minutes, and I'll run over there and play a real quick. Uh, that, that, that would be great. Thank you so much, Bob, for your wisdom, your talent, your time, and your generosity today. Yeah, thank you. Let's come back and do some more. Pick a subject yeah. like antennas or Yeah, like antennas. Phasing. Yeah, phasing. Yeah. I love the doing that. I have Good. a whole hour on we'll that. Do one, we'll do that one in the fall on phasing. Yes. So, uh, Call me. I'll be here. Sounds yeah, good. Right. So you're going to the organ, and we'll, we'll yep. hear you on the organ side. 7-3, everybody. We'll see you soon. Don't be afraid to email me. I'm here for you.
Yeah. He's on he's on QRZ. So we'll hear a little uh, organ music, which you can hear on uh, Zoom, but you can't hear, I guess, illegally on uh, on uh, ham radio. Okay, Bob Heil on the organ. Fantastic. We have applause. Thank you so much, Bob. 73 from the Sierra Nevada Amateur Radio Society up in the Reno, Nevada, Sierra area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's do more. Thank you. 73. Okay, this completes the presentation portion of the SNARS monthly meeting with Bob Heil, K9EID from Heil Sound, and uh, we'll stop the recording now.